Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's virtual lunch meeting. My name is Alec O'Dare, and I'm the uh, Managing Director for Wound Care People and the Journal of Community Nursing. Um, today's session is Negative Pressure Wound Therapy, simplified with PICO, and it's in association with uh, Smith & Nephew, so I'd like to start by thanking those for their support for this event today. Today's speakers are Kate McCarthy and Rommel Orig, who are with me now. Kate, Rommel, how are you? Hi, good, Great. thank you. Hi, Alec. Very good. Thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for uh, agreeing to, uh, to to take part in this presentation today. Um, for those of you who are joining us for the first time for a virtual lunch meeting, um, we started doing these uh, towards the back end of last year as a way to uh, give you access to product information and to basically replace currently uh, the, 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 the types of meetings that you would have normally been getting uh, through company representatives. So the idea is that you get to learn uh, about a product while gaining some CPD time while learning uh, or keeping up to date with what uh, what is available within the wound care market. So certificates will be available uh, to download after the event as usual. Please ask as many questions as you can because we'll be coming back with a live Q&A after the presentation. Uh, any technical issues do bear with us. Uh, it just leaves me to say um, enjoy the presentation. Kate Rommel, I will join you back for the live Q&A uh, once you've finished. Good luck. Thank you. Thank yes, you. thank you. Hi, um, hi everybody, and thank you, Alec, for that brief introduction. Uh, so my name is Rommel Orig. I am the complex specialist from Smith and Nephew, um, covering um, Birmingham area. And alongside with me here today is my lovely friend and colleague Kate McCarthy. Um, so we both registered nurses, and we both have background in patient liability. Now, um, firstly, before I pass over to Kate um, to begin the session. I would like to say really thank you so much for attending this lunch meeting. I know you are all really busy and um, your time is valuable and particularly, um, well, if you're watching this and you're on your day off, it's the first day of opening of the non-essential shop. So excellent thank you to you for attending this meeting. Um, so we will make sure we stick to time and um, we hope that you will take some valuable knowledge um, today around the use of negative pressure. Um, particularly um, around peak care. So over to you, Kay. Thank you, Ramal. Um, so I think what Ramal and I wanted to do really um, today was to present um, and make this as real as possible um, and perhaps dispel some of the common misconceptions or perceptions around negative pressure wound therapy um, and how complicated um, it can sometimes be perceived to use. Um, so we'll be chatting through two um, real life clinical scenarios that Rommel and I were both um, involved with um, and we both advised on. Um, but we structured some learning objectives um, in. So if you wanted to put those in for your CPD, um, it gives you some structure for those. So we will cover, um, hopefully, an understanding the mode of action of negative pressure wound therapy between full system and PICO, which is single use negative pressure wound therapy. Identify some of the indications. So where we would use it and what sort of wound you could use it on. Some of the contraindications and precautions or the watch out um, when initiating negative pressure and then describe some of the basic dressing application techniques for PICO as well. So without further ado, um, we'll start with um, the first case scenario, which was a case that I was um, involved in. Um, so this is case study one. So this gentleman was 54 years old um, and he had a seven month history um, of static venous ulceration, which you can see in the picture um, on the screen. Um, the treatment regime that was used when I became involved was a NA dressing or non-adherent dressing under full system compression for layer bandaging. And there was some superficial slug present, um, but there was poor quality granulation tissue. Um, there was a little bit of varicose eczema um, to the ankle and the wound edges were macerated. So with this being said, this wound had been present for seven months. So what I wanted to do was intervene with PICO to accelerate um, the wound healing and trajectory to get this wound healed as quickly as possible. Um, so that's what that's that's how we intervened with this patient. So I think Rommel might have something that he wanted yeah. to ask. Um, you touching a bit. What do you want to ask me? I, did, I wasn't sure when, when to ask the question because as you were presenting the case study, and I think um, one particular considerations I may have, you know. 
you describe the chronicity of the wound. And I'll probably, I hope you don't mind, I'll, I'll, I'll probably thinking not to go straight away with PICA, but consider some other forms of intervention uh, prior to um, considering PICA. What's your thoughts around that? Or what's the rationale of going for PICA as a treatment option? You know what, You're, you are absolutely right. And traditionally, um, we, we know that gold standard therapy for venous ulceration is compression bandaging, and that, that hasn't changed. However, like I said, this wound had been present for seven months. Um, and what I was conscious of was the evidence that has been produced by um, Caroline Dowsett and Jane Hampton. Um, and what they did is they looked at introducing PICO um, as a, a short term intervention um, on a variety of wounds that weren't following that normal healing trajectory. Um, and I think what you hopefully be able to see on, on, the, on the graph that's on the screen is what they did is they looked at a group of wounds that weren't, weren't healing or were static or deteriorating and intervened with PICO for a short term period of time. And what they noticed was from, from that intervention was that it kick-started that wound healing trajectory back into a more normal pattern. But interestingly, what they also found was once that intervention had actually stopped, that wound healing trajectory continued and the wounds continued to heal um, in a much more timely manner. So that was my thought process behind it, intervening with PICO in order to accelerate or kick-start uh, the wound from healing. Um, yeah, so... Once I think, you know, when you're faced with chronic wounds, um, you know, I, I completely understand about the kickstarting of the wound healing process. And that's, and I think it's great to see the evidence from um, Dowsett and Hampton. Um, what's your thoughts around biofilm? Because I'm always, it's a bit of a red flag for me when considering negative pressure. So we know, you know, we talk about wound preparation in conjunction with that. And we know either from my experience, either a presence of a biofilm, or um, any other debris within the wound that may impede or slow down the effects of negative pressure? Um, again, you're absolutely right, and a great question as well. And if we go back to the, the, the case study um, description, um, this was static, i.e. it was non-healing, and there was some slough present, and there was also poor quality granulation, but this wound wasn't immediately or, or didn't appear to be clinically infected. Um, so we know from recent evidence that suggests that chronic wounds, um, up to 78% of chronic wounds actually have mature biofilm present. So with that in mind, and like you say, those red flags that you, you quite correctly picked up on, um, I immediately thought bio, biofilm as, as something that's actually stopping this wound from progressing. Um, Conversely, if the wound had been clinically infected, I would have chosen an antimicrobial or silver-based antimicrobial. And Acticote Flex 3 is compatible with PICO, and I would have actually utilized the antimicrobial with the PICO at that point in time. However, it wasn't clinically infected. So then that led me to think about biofilm. So what we had, I actually advised to use was Iodaflex for that two-week period uh, use of antimicrobial before starting um, negative pressure therapy. And it's really important that that wound bed is fully prepared before you intervene with negative pressure to make sure that you get the most positive outcome um, when utilising PICO. I think I completely agree there because it's, it's, it's about preparing those granulation tissues and say ready for it to respond with, with negative pressure. Now I've got another question if we can go back to the case study around wound bed. Now you mentioned that there was some slough present uh, in the wound bed. Now where when we are presented with a chronic wound, and um, most of the chronic wounds, we would not have this lovely presence of granulation tissue. Um, how do you navigate around presence of devitalized tissue within the wound bed and the considerations for negative pressure like PICO? There's a couple of things to consider there. You know, slough doesn't necessarily mean that the wound is infected or that there perhaps is a problem. It's when that balance tips over into slough becoming a harbor for bacteria. Um, because obviously that, 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 that bacteria will, 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 um, uh, will stop that wound from progressing as, as, we, as we know. Um, and I think the other part of, uh, of slough is it can actually hide what's in a wound bed. So depending on the amount of slough and the, the quality of the slough, if you like, um, if we don't debride that or de-slough, one, you've got a harbour for bacteria, which we need, to, we need to address. But secondly, if we don't clear the wound bed, we can't make an accurate assessment of what's going on in the wound bed itself. 
So, for example, if we had a, a deeper wound uh, with larger plugs of slough, what we would want to do is to debride or de-slough um, the, the, the stuff out of the way, um, because it might be hiding something that we would want to protect, for example, a bone or, or tendon. So that wound bed preparation is really important. As a general rule, if there is slough present, what we generally say is if it's a thin layer of less than 20%, um, if you're using a percentage um, calculation in your wound assessment, then you could still use PICO um, on, on, on an open wound. I hope that answers the question. Yes, uh, a great tip there in terms of percentage of volume of, of slough. Some will say 20, some will say 30, but you, you know, a great insight really there. Um, Another question around around wound bed. Now, what I can see from the um, from the large area. Now, I would class this wound as, as a large wound. Now, some might think um, maybe it's too big for a pico. Um, that special therapy system. Um, what's your thoughts around that? Um, you, you're again a great question and I think one that um, people it would quite rightly quite rightly ask you know what is the difference and why would you choose PICO over traditional negative pressure lots of people with more um, familiar with ne um, full system negative pressure and I think whatever intervention um, we think about utilizing with a patient we need to think about their experience and also clinician resource and time now what I what I didn't say at the beginning was that this gentleman was actually coming into clinic two sometimes three times a week in the district nurse leg clinic and having his dressings changed um, which is obviously quite um, it's it's time heavy for the patient but also again for clinicians in terms of clinic time so what I had in the back of my mind was again another um, some more evidence um, by uh, Kersner. Um, who did um, a large uh, RCT on over 160 patients, specifically looking at lower limb ulcerations, so included venous leg ulcers and diabetic foot ulcers, to actually look at the difference. Why would you use full system? Why would you use PICO? Now, clinically, there was, um, there was, it was comparative in terms of clinical outcomes. Um, however, like I said, we need to consider the patient experience and what they found from that was that it was um, much better tolerated by a patient, it was much more comfortable. And again, when we think about leg ulceration in particular, the patient's already got bulky four layer bandages uh, in place already. So PICO is, is um, applied with a simple dressing, um, which is gonna be much more um, um, easy for that patient to wear. And they're obviously not having to carry a large um, uh, uh, bulky system with them. Um, in terms of moving around and being active. From a clinician perspective, in terms of time, um, it's less time in clinic, it's much easier to apply. Um, so we have to consider the impact on resources. Now, PICO also can be left in place for seven days. So what we managed to do by utilising PICO was um, reduce the amount of visit time to clinics from two to three times a week to once a week which, you know, as clinician yourself, you know that the, the impact of that would be. So that, again, was my thought process behind that. Now, you, you mentioned you use it in conjunction with um, compression therapy. Now, how does PICO work under compression? It is, would, would you consider it under a light compression or a full compression? Um, what's your thoughts? So, um, PICO is, has a unique airlock layer, which relies on um, an air exchange to take place in order to facilitate um, the negative pressure to be distributed evenly over the whole of the pad. Now, if that became occluded, so for example, if the patient was sitting or lying on the PICO, then absolutely that would occlude the dressing and not allow the air exchange to take place. However, under compression bandaging, it's not occlusive. It allows the air exchange to take place. So as long as you have achieved that initial seal before you um, apply the bandages over the top, you should be absolutely fine. It doesn't occlude the dressing at all. That is great um, tips there. Now, would you mind walking us through on how you actually applied uh, PICO <laughs> over a, a leg also patient? We know how complex a leg also can be. So would you mind showing us uh, on how you did or advised um, other clinicians of using PICO over a leg also? Yeah, absolutely. And I think probably one of the best ways to demonstrate that is um, through the use of um, a video, actually. Um, so I think um, if we have that going, I'll 
I'll talk you through an application of Pico on um, a leg ulcer. Um, so this is utilizing a 15 by 20 size pad on leg ulceration. When the Pico comes, it will arrive in a box and there will be one pump and two dressings in each kit. As you can see there, we've got um, a leg ulcer. And what I would say is to ensure that all the peri wound area in the skin is dry so in order to make sure that the, the dressing sticks. So we just take off um, a side of the, the, the paddle, uh, the side of the dressing and start to smooth that down. You want the ulcer um, or the wound on the lower part of the, the dressing itself with the port facing uppermost or up the leg if it was um, put onto a leg ulcer. The borders are silicon. So they allow you to reposition. And what I would say is a little tip is to spend some time really smoothing down those edges to get rid of any creases that might appear um, when you put it on, and obviously when you're smoothing it around the leg. The next bit is to put the batteries in. This is the bit I find the most complicated, putting batteries inside the pump itself. Slide the back off and pop the batteries inside, which come all within the kit. When that happens, all four indicators should illuminate, which means the pump's ready to go. A little FYI here that the Pico pump does contain a magnet, but it's no stronger um, than one that would be in your iPhone or iPad. Connect the pump to the tubing through a lure lock connection that is the top, make sure it's secure and press the orange button to deliver the negative pressure. It takes about 60 seconds to draw down and that ensures that negative pressure is distributed across the whole of the pad. While that's happening, the air leak indicator will alarm and the green OK will, um, will visually alarm as well. The seal, the green OK indicator will flash by itself and that means that you're good to go, you've achieved a seal and it's ready to, to, to have the rest of the dressing completed. If there was a leak, I would spend this time going round the dressing as the nurse is doing on the video just to smooth out any um, creases that you might see. You'll find in the box some fixation strips as well. These need to border the whole of the dressing, not overlapping the white part of the Pico pad itself. So we picture framing it really with the, the film strips and this helps to secure that Pico in place. Obviously it's on a movable limb, so we wanna make sure that that seal stays on for the time frame that you want between dressing changes. So this will help to secure that in place. Once you've done this, you can make the decision whether or not you bring the patient back to clinic. As I say, the dressing can stay in place for up to seven days. So there are a range of pad sizes available and your local Smith and Nephew team will be able to help you with that decision choice depending on the wound size and type. So that was a bit of a whistle stop tour of, the, of an application on a, on a, on a leg. Um, I hope that that makes sense um, of how easy it is to apply um, under compression um, bandaging. And um, like I say, your local Smith and Nephew team um, would be able to support um, with that um, as well. Um, I don't think I've got any further questions unless you have anything to expand or to add. No, no, no. I'm, I'm happy. And thank you for your, for your questions and prompting to expand on, on, on that case scenario. And just, just, just to say the outcome of that, that um, the, the case study there was after the PICO intervention, we actually used it for three weeks. Um, that patient went from when I first initially met them to completely healed within six weeks of intervention, which is great news. That's great results, um, actually, and thank you for, for sharing um, your insights and that because I know how complex leg ulcers can be. And I think it is important to, uh, to understand um, the role of negative pressure, um, particularly PICO, and how it can kickstart some of these chronic venous leg ulcerations um, into a healing trajectory. So, um, Thank you. So I guess that leaves me now for me to kick off for the second case study. So this is the second case study for this afternoon. So this is a lady who had, um, she had a bowel obstruction and during the cycle of the pandemic and she was admitted to hospital and she subsequently went and had an emergency laparotomy. Now she recovered uh, very well following the surgery 
but unfortunately she developed some wound complication of a partial wound resistance. That's the lower aspect um, of the wound. It was slow to progress with conventional dressings. Now, to protect her from um, COVID infection within hospital and to free up some of the hospital beds, um, she was discharged to the community quite swiftly, actually. Uh, and she was managed by the district nurses. Now, the district nurses were um, dressing the wound um, daily with the conventional dressings, and they found that the wound was still slow to progress, and the patient was anxious. Obviously, the district nurses coming in daily about COVID transmission, and of course, potential further complication, further wound complications. So, with that in mind, with the description of the wound there, five centimeter by four centimeter diameter, and four centimeter in depth, you've got good granulation tissue. The district nurses phoned me and said, well, we need to speed up some healing process here and reduce our nurse visits. What do you think? So subsequently, following our discussion, um, we started, um, they started the patient on, on PICO7. So I'm just going to interject there sorry you know me if I've got a question I need to ask um so okay. that actually looks like quite a large wound um to me um you've got some quite big dimensions there and it looks you've got sort of four centimeters depth there as well did you not think that you know traditional fill system negative pressure would have been more suited to what looks like potentially quite a wet wound I would say I, I think I can see where you're coming from. You're talking about a wet wound and you're probably thinking about the, the exudate levels of this wound. You're probably not alone in thinking when, you, when you're faced with this kind of wound, a cavity wound with a deeper wound, you're thinking, right, this is going to be a wet wound for a disposable system like, like PICO. Where in fact, um, PICO as a, as a kit, for example, the PICO 7 um, with two dressing kit, it can handle, it can manage up to an exudate of 300 mils of exudate. So if we break that down, within the kit, there's two pads. So each pad can handle about 150 mils of exudate. So in total for a week, it's about 300 mils. Now, if you wanna push that boundary of the dressing absorption of the pad, because you have got a, a, a a larger or um, a, a deeper wound, you can push that boundary a little if you um, if you will have a bigger pad. So bigger pad means bigger absorption capacity. So that's the physical absorption of the pad. But really, I think most importantly, what I would like to say, PICO is more than a conventional dressing. It will, of course, absorb the exudate and manage the exudate and the physical properties of the product. But what it can do as a therapy, it enhances the, bio, the biological function of the body. What I mean by that is by the application of PICO um, over these wounds, it will actually push the fluid back into the lymphatics, increasing lymphatic drainage, thereby managing the exudate that way. So it's, it manages exudate in two approach, physical absorption into the pad and enhancing the biological function of the body pushing back fluid into the lymphatics, thereby reducing the volume of exudate. Hmm, that sounds very interesting. But could, I mean, we, we said that we talk a little bit about how, how PICO works. So could you maybe just elaborate a little bit more for, the, for everybody about the last point you just made? I will, I will try, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm talking about lymphatic drainage and increasing absorption. Um, of some of the exudate back into the system. Uh, so I, I think it, it's best to explain this if I start by refreshing some of your knowledge uh, around the mode of action of negative pressure. So hopefully you can see in your screen now on the left-hand side are those widely accepted mode of action of negative pressure. I'm gonna talk a little bit slow here because if we are getting, we might get a little bit technical for some. So if you're thinking I'm talking funny, it's your signal, it's not. I'm just talking a little bit slow. So the mode of action of negative pressure, the traditional system is we're talking about um, protection from external contaminants. And, and that is very true because you are using a film to seal the filler or to seal that um, the dressing for you to be able to deliver negative pressure and you're changing the dressing less frequent. So there's a good protection there. So the next mode of action I would like to discuss is the macro deformation. So macro deformation, that means the splinting of the wound margin. So you bring that wound together, okay? Next would be the micro deformation. So I'm talking about cellular stretching at the wound level. So that encourages the formation of granulation tissue when you're talking about negative pressure. 
plus you are pushing the edema or relieving the edema by managing that fluid because you're constantly sucking the exudate away. So you are having that um, increase in, um, in vessel clearance, if you like, thereby increasing perfusion. Now, all of these clinical attributes, I would say, with the traditional negative system, you can see in the circle now, which is green, are, I would class this as localized. So all of those clinical benefits that I've just said, macro deformation, micro edema, will be fairly much localized within the wound bed, mainly because on how you deliver traditional negative pressure. Now, on the other hand, if you're using PICO, um, you can see in the illustration on your right, imagine all those localized clinical attributes or clinical effects. You will have that with PICO, whether you'll use um, a filler, you a gauze or a foam or application of PICO direct. So you will have the localized effect plus because you're sitting a pad to deliver negative pressure. You mentioned earlier what the airlock technology of the product is unique with PICO you will be delivering negative pressure, not just at the wound bed or within the confines of the wound, you are extending the benefit, the clinical benefits um, into a wider um, area beyond the wound margins. And we think this combined clinical attributes of both will give you better outcomes, well, particularly if you're looking at chronic wound management. So, so that's really interesting that you say that. So why, why with chronic wounds is, is PICO the, the sort of the better or the, the optimal choice for negative pressure? Could you maybe expand a little bit on that for us? No. <laughs> in the interest of science and then continuing in the scientific explanation, right, I would like you to, if you are sitting and watching this, I would like you to imagine um, a chronic wound that you're currently managing. That could be a polynibal sinus, um, that could be um, a non-healing traumatic wound. So if we're looking at the anatomy of the chronic wound, we know that chronic wounds will present edema on the surrounding skin because of the chronicity of the wound. Static wound margins, they're not advancing, they're not doing anything. Or if they're advancing very, very slow, poor cellular development, you're not getting any granulation tissue, and, this is, and poor, potentially poor vascular supply. So in general, these are potentially the, the anatomy of an appearance of a chronic wound. Now, I hope you remember what I just said momentarily about the mode of action of negative pressure. So with that illustration in mind, good imagination, if we apply negative pressure over this chronic wound um, application of filler and that pad, we'll be pushing potentially the edema back into the system, increasing lymphatic drainage. Now, those static margins, because we're applying negative pressure, macro deformation, remember, let's bring that margins together, thereby stimulating the margins to do something. So it's called almost what I call it tissue approximation. At the cellular level, those poor cellular development or static um, cells, we hope that the PICO or negative pressure will be able to stimulate those cells to do something and thereby, because of the negative pressure, increasing the vascularity um, of that wound. Now, all of those combined effects of the mode of action when you're using it over a chronic wound would kickstart these chronic wounds into some form of healing trajectory. I love a bit of science. <laughs> I hope I explained that clearly. <laughs> it was very good, thank you. But, and, and actually joking aside, you can see when you've explained that mode of action, particularly with my patient with the, 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 in the compression therapy, yes. got a therapy there that's supporting incompetent um, valves and um, within uh, within the venous system. Um, so when you combine that with PICO, which is increasing that vascular supply, you can see why both of them work so so very well together. So, so explaining that so so eloquently, that was great. So I just want to go back to your um, scenario um, again as well, because I've got another little question. Another um, one. Um, <laughs> um, but it's just about the depth, really. Um, obviously, the, the, the case that I used was very superficial, but you've got a four centimetre depth there um, yep. with that abdominal wound. Did you use a filler? How did you manage that with PICO? Um, using PICO, well, PICO firstly um, is indicated for superficial wounds and for deeper wounds. Now, it's suitable for wounds with wounds that are greater than three centimeter. Um, now, 
if you're looking at um, lab data, PICO can support the use of negative pressure or its use up to a depth of 4.5 centimeters as a maximum depth. Although we do, I've seen some case studies where, or a case study that um, they use PICO um, up to seven centimeters in depth. So, however, if we're looking at evidence, Theresa Heard in her publication with 400 um, case studies, her wound depth range is from four centimeters to 4.2. So for me, um, I think it's safe to say that you can use PICO up to depth of 4.5 centimeter if we're looking at lab data and evidence um, combined. But what I would like to, to say or emphasize is when you're assessing um, a deep wound, particularly on an abdomen, just be mindful about the presence of um, vital structures. So I'm talking, around, I'm talking about the presence of either a bowel or an unexplored fistula, because the application of negative pressure direct over these structures is, is a contraindication. Now, I'm not saying that this is a regular or common occurrence, but it can happen. So it, it is um, a watch out. Um, however, if you are um, examining a wound or assessing a wound with some deep undermining or tunneling, as long as you can reach the base of the wound by a wound swab or a glove finger, um, and you can explore those areas and eliminate the presence of those vital structures, then please proceed with negative pressure, traditional or um, the use of PICA. I think that that just goes back to the point I was making about preparing the wound bed and being able to identify everything that's that's obviously there. So you, you've got a really clear wound assessment of what structures there may be within the wound bed itself. Um, so I guess that would be the same if there was exposed bone or tendon. So if there was uh, those sort of areas that you would want to protect from negative pressure, what would you do in that scenario? A oh, great question there, because um, when we're talking about um, exposed structures, rightly pointed out, bones and tendons, and I think it's just bringing it back to the clinical setting, and, and some of these bones or tendons are commonly found where we're assessing um, diabetic foot ulcerations or um, pressure ulcers, for example. Yeah. And I think, you know, talking about pressure ulcers, for me as a clinician, um, we know how difficult um, they are to, to heal and manage pressure ulcers are. And we are faced with exposed bone or tendon um, on these pressure ulcers. I always consider the use of negative pressure, of course, alongside the appropriate selection of equipment, repositioning, repositioning nutrition, et cetera, et cetera. Um, however, bringing it back to the use of negative pressure with exposed bone or tendon, I would advise to cover these structures with a non-adherent dressing um, or um, a silicon wound contact um, layer. It's just to protect these um, structures, um, avoiding them to go dry. And that's, that could be one of the potential complications you will face if we don't protect them. So once you've got that protected, apply negative pressure and, and, and that, should be, um, that should be good to go. Um, I think bringing it back to the clinical scenario is from a bone perspective, it is important that we consider negative pressure because it, they are difficult to granulate over. And when exposed for a prolonged period of time, the risk of um, infection and osteomyelitis would be significantly high and could be detrimental to um, a patient's condition. you would do um you know in that in that scenario um so just to, to i'm just conscious of time and um, so i'm just gonna ask a little bit of a practical question because i'm looking at that picture and i've dressed many wounds with negative pressure before um and i think lots of people will probably be thinking the same thing that that abdominal wound is very close to a stoma side that's obviously been formed um for that patient um, that's quite often a very common challenge when applying a negative pressure, whether it be full system or, or PICO um, on, a, on an abdominal wound. How did you get a good feel with that? <laughs> so <laughs> briefly, <laughs> so brief, to answer that question briefly, uh, one thing to say is when you're using negative pressure, the most important thing is achieving a good seal. Mm -hmm. For this particular case study, it's about an application of a gel patch, the Venice's gel patch. And, and you can apply this um, gel patch when you're dealing with awkward areas like an axilla or a groin or in the natal cleft. So, and I think it's vital to, um, to apply this um, just, just increase the adhesion of the seal, um, that one. And um, 
just to walk you through on what we've done to this particular patient. So hopefully what you can see now is not abdominal wound again. Um, so for this particular patient, we, um, to begin the application of negative pressure, so what we've done is the application of a wound filler into the cavity. So you will have an option, is either you apply a foam or you apply a gauze. So for this uh, particular case, the district nurses use gauze filler. Once you apply the gauze filler, it's just like application of the conventional dressings. If we take the stoma away, sit the pico pad on top, that should be you're, you're all done. However, because of the stoma is there, is the application of a gel patch. So you cut it into strip. So just apply it into where the area you think are the, what I call a weak spot in terms of achieving a good seal. Once you apply that, apply the pico pad on top. Again, as you said earlier, making sure positioning the port at the uppermost part of the, um, of the body, connect it to the pump, and then um, away you go. That's that. My, my last um, question is, um, I spoke about the, the sort of patient experience with using PICO. How did you find uh, the patient experience here? What was the outcome of, of, your, of your scenario? Amazing question to, to hopefully um, end this session, um, because the, the outcome of this case study is truly um, amazing. And even for me as a clinician, um, it, was, it was great to see um, having started as a um, uh, slow to heal, was slow to respond to and the application of PICO in only two weeks, um, they managed to achieve 100% uh, wound closure. And the patient was absolutely ecstatic and relieved um, that she had now got a healed wound and um, with no risk of other complications and COVID infection. However, from a healthcare professional point of view, um, great work from Sharon Lloyd, um, the district nurse team leader in Birmingham, who worked hard with this particular patient because it allowed them, by the use of PICO, it has allowed them to reduce their nursing visits. Um, so initially twice weekly, and then when they left the dressing for, um, for seven days, um, that gives them more time to do other things and see more patients. Um, plus achieving 100% wound closure in two weeks is absolutely a fantastic outcome all in all. That's amazing. And, and having been a district nurse myself, I can fully appreciate the impact that well, significantly in the last year as well with COVID, that actually releasing um, time um, by utilising advanced therapies like this is, is, is paramount at, at the moment. Um, so well done to you and to Sharon and the team as well. That's a, an amazing achievement. Um, and I bet I'm pretty sure the patient was delighted with that outcome. So thank you for sharing that. Um, so that sort of concludes our case scenarios. So I'm thinking that Alec may have, or hopefully has, that would be happy to answer. Um, if, um, if I can hand over to Alec. Uh, thank you, Kate. Yeah, we certainly had a few questions in. I think you two are oh. doing such a good job, though. I think you're a great double act, a great presentation. <laughs> um, double I was act. Thinking, Holly, uh, eat your heart out, that's uh, it. <laughs> I was thinking I don't really have much of a job to do today, do I? Because these two have done such a great job of, uh, of going through the questions. Uh, however, uh, we've had uh, uh, quite a few people watching the presentation today. So that in itself has come with, uh, come with lots of questions. Uh, so we'll just crack straight onto them and then see how many we can, uh, how many we can get through. Sure. Um, question number one is for you, Rommel. It is, I think you mentioned that you used Pico 7 on the wound for three weeks. Would it have been better to use PICO-14? Um, I think a great question there, Alec. Um, this is probably from somebody um, who's got good awareness about all the different types of PICO there. So for seven days and indeed PICO-14 will last you for 14 days. Um, but yeah, I think in hindsight, uh, a PICO-14 would have been a, a, a much more cost-effective um, option really. But uh, I suppose if you are... I would say testing the waters. So if you're dealing with tricky areas for, for negative pressure, my advice is um, start with either a PICO-7, see how the patient tolerates or whether you can achieve a good seal and it maintains that good seal. And once you achieve that, absolutely step up to a PICO-14. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, Kate, the next question is for you. So this is PICO has been, uh, PICO has been used here on a leg ulcer and an abdominal wound. What other wounds can it be used on? And are there any wounds that you would avoid? Uh, yeah, great question, actually. So PICO is indicated on a variety um, of different wounds from diabetic foot ulcers, leg ulceration and open wounds. 
Um, there are some watch outs or some contraindications where we wouldn't use. Um, and actually that's uh, the sort of the main ones are what we, what we said before is anything unexplored or anything that you can't identify you wouldn't want to be initiating PICO with. Um, also, if there is any known malignancy um, within a wound, we talked about increasing that vascular supply um, when we initiate negative pressure. So we wouldn't want to do that if there was known malignancy, unless it's in special use in palliative care. Um, and that's uh, used for a quality of life or, or wound management in that scenario. Um, and also one that we get asked a lot about um, is around osteomyelitis when there is bone present as well. So this is a good opportunity for me to just clarify. So it's when it's untreated osteomyelitis, you wouldn't want to initiate negative pressure. If there is a discussion between the medical team or surgical team, the patient and um, yourselves as clinicians, uh, that it's been treated and um, you're happy to use negative pressure, then yes, move forward, but it must be treated osteomyelitis um, beforehand. So I guess the crux of it is it can be used in a whole range of wounds, but we need to be able to identify what's going on in that wound before starting. That would be how I would answer. Uh, thank you. That was a pretty comprehensive answer there. Um, question number question number three. Uh, this is for both of you, so we'll just I'll randomly start with Rommel, and then we'll go over to you, Kate. Um, so this is from Faith, and this is the, re the, the recent um, NWCSP recommendation. So that's the, um, the the National Wound Care Strategy Program recommendations. Advocate a simple low adherent dressing under compression. So why use PICO? The NPWT Cochrane Review advises for surgical wounds, not leg ulcers. Please direct me to the evidence base. Okay, do you want me to? Yeah. Rommel, do you want to start, start oh, with sorry, that? So it's it's yeah, two sorry. questions as well. Yeah. Right, so um, thanks, Faye, for um, a very um, sort of comprehensive sort of question there. Um, particularly the evidence if we're using negative pressure, so we're talking about the non-adherent um, sort of properties of um, addressing that you will be using for leg ulcerations, I suppose is what you're trying to establish here. Now, PICO has got a silicon wound contact layer. So as addressing itself, it fits into the criteria. So it's a non-adherent um, wound dressing pad that you are applying um, to a particular wound or a leg ulcer. The only difference is, is you attach it to the device to deliver the therapy um, would be my, um, my response. So I think I'll leave the rest for Kate. I hope I've answered that particular question. I'll just I'll just add on to that before you talk because I know that you'll probably talk about surgical but just to add on to that and yes thank you so for that is that it's important to to note here that we're not advocating PICO to be used on all leg ulceration you know um the the, the standard or the gold standard treatment um for for leg ulcers as we know um is compression uh, compression therapy or compression hosiery in whichever form um, is best suited to that patient with the various different options that are available. Um, we utilize PICO for non-healing non or, or, or kick-starting um, leg ulceration. So I wouldn't advocate utilizing PICO as a standard treatment in leg ulceration. That doesn't move away from um, an NA dressing with compression, absolutely not. And you were right to point that out. It's when there is a static um, or chronicity to the leg ulceration where we utilize negative pressure to kickstart that process. So I just wanted to clarify that, um, Ronald, but I'm sure you've got something to add for surgical. Yeah, and I think from an evidence point of view, um, you mentioned, Kate, in your presentation, and hopefully either we can embed it into the presentation um, when when this um, recording goes out, is looking at KERSNET, which is the randomized control trial, and we're looking at the use of negative pressure. And one of the biggest cohort uh, patients in that study, I think if I remember it rightly, so it's 106 patients, um, and they're almost above 50% of them are leg ulcer patients um, when they use um, PICO versus the traditional system. And again, Dowsett and Hampton. Um, majority of the population in that particular piece of work are uh, patients with venous um, leg ulcerations. And so as McCluskey in Ireland, when she tried to establish a kick-starting wound healing um, using PICO. Um, okay. Um, thank you both. Um, Faith, just uh, just to clarify, basically, if, we, if there are any questions that we haven't answered um, today, we will get back to them. And any questions that even we are answering, um, we will put these to both uh, Rommel and Kate so that they can have a chance to just review the answers they've given and then we'll put them 
as, as a document alongside the slides on our website uh, for you to download in, uh, in, in a couple of days. So any questions that, um, that uh, as I said, that, it, that we haven't managed to get through to, we will actually get through to them at, um, at some point. Um, so this is, this, this is now the final question, I think, because of the time. So um, this is from Deb, um, and this is for both of you again, I think. It says, uh, I've only ever used Pico on surgical abdo wounds. Also, the GP surgeries don't like us to use Pico pumps out in the community because of the expense. How do we as clinicians overcome this? Uh, Kate, do you want to start with that one? Um, yeah, absolutely. And, and, I, and I think I can really relate to that, um, having worked in the community for the majority of my career, actually. Um, and I think um, it's, it is difficult um, when you're working alongside other clinicians and relying on those um, to, to prescribe um, on, on your behalf. But I think, you know, we, we, have, to, we have to be proactive um, with tackling um, chronic wounds um, on our caseload. And I think if we if we are you know open and honest with um, GPs and actually can present some of the evidence like we've presented to you today, and um, with how actually these proactive um, um, therapies can actually reduce um, the amount of time that that wounds are particularly on your on your caseload. Um, I know that that is easier said than done, but it really is about working alongside GPs and, and to really to, to give them a rationale or a clinical rationale for, for those, um, those decision-making around, around prescribing. But I do understand mm -hmm. that that is a challenge having, having been there myself. So I do sympathize with, with that. But I, I think it's just having a really robust rationale um, and, and going forward as you would do with any, any, any prescription request with, it, with a GP. <sighs> Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, I think for me it's about you know where GPs or um, other prescribers might consider the the, the a cost per unit of a product. I think for me as a tip, we, for me as a clinician, I think we need to dial up the discussion um, around um, unit cost of a particular product. I think we need to be having discussions around outcomes and around healing rates. So looking at the case studies that we presented today in both wound types without the help of potentially therapists like Pico, most likely these wounds will probably still be open up to now, or will take longer to heal and will become more costly. So just dial the discussion up a little bit around um, what you want to achieve from an outcome perspective and the speed of that um, wind, achieving wound closure. Yeah, I think, you know, when it comes to talking about decisions about cost, you know, what's the, what, what are we measuring that against? You know, as Rommel said, um, you could potentially have been dressing that abdominal wound for up to, what, three months, four months um, with, with conventional dressings. Uh, whereas we look at the, the, the cost associated with PICO and actually that wound's healed within two weeks. So I guess it's, it comes down to a, 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 what, what are we comparing that to? And I think just one point to add, Alex, sorry. Um, if you're struggling in terms of, because sometimes this could be a discussion around um, appropriate use on how to use these products into the right wounds. Now, within Smith and Nephew, um, we have a robust pathway that hopefully that, um, that you can use um, as a guide on when to use PICO and, and when to stop PICO. And equally, if you, are, um, if you want to generate your own local evidence, that could be a simple case study, for example. Um, you know, please get in touch with your local Smith and Nephew representative because that's something that we can provide you. So it's either a pathway or we can support you in terms of generating that evidence. Um, yeah, good. That's actually what I was just about to say. So that's uh, that's a good um, a good point to end on uh, both. Um, thank you again for uh, for a wonderful and informative presentation. Um, we will uh, we'll be back in a month actually with Smith and Nephew again, talking about uh, in for an evening session talking about. Um, uh, Pico, so do join us then. We'll have more information going out. And I happen to know that um, it's the 10th anniversary of, uh, of Pico in May, so you've got some exciting things that we should all look out for <laughs> taking, uh, taking place. Um, there should be a link on the screen now for you to download your certificate for attendance today. Uh, as Rommel and Kate said, if there's any more information you want, uh, please do get in touch. Uh, from, uh, from tomorrow, I think a copy of the video uh, from today's session that you'll be able to share with your colleagues um, or rewatch if, uh, if, if you fancy that and download the slides will be available. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your day and we look forward to welcoming you back um, for our next session. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.